students, uh, first of all, welcome to you all for joining us in the session. Uh, global uh, global will change and trade policy. Actually, <coughs> global will change are really transforming the nature of the production uh, in the world. Uh, you can say it. Uh, final goods are increasingly made by combining in foreign and domestic inputs through supply networks that actually pass through across both the country borders and also the traditional boundaries of the farm. Uh, this global wealth change or evolution has attracted you know, widespread interest of business leaders and policy makers in this regard. Uh, the World Trade Organization is uh, exploring how trade policy institutions can be modernized to face this new reality. Uh, in other words, the growing fragmentation of uh, goods across the globe actually uh, requires the countries to have uh, a, a transparent, uh, efficient, or uh, you can say the predictable uh, trade and invest investment regimes because tariffs and non-tariffs barriers uh, and some other restrictive measures are not only uh, affecting the domestic supply of suppliers but also foreign suppliers. So, in today's seminar, the main focus is on such complementarity between the global wealth change and uh, trade policy in order to help, in order to promote growth, investment, and uh, employment uh, in developing countries in particular. So, we have two spe speakers today for the session. One is Ghulam Samad. Actually, he is presenting uh, on intellectual property rights in global wealth chains. Actually, Dr. Ghulam Samad uh, is senior research economist and uh, he has done his PhD on innovations, knowledge creation, and spatial spillovers. And uh, that would be very informative uh, talk for the student, uh, in particular, who are working on knowledge economy or you can say the intellectual property rights. And our second speaker for today is Gonzalo Varela. Uh, who will speak on global value chain and economic integration, where is Pakistan positioned? The presentation will discuss the emergence of global value chain uh, in the global trade arena and present some indicators of where Pakistan is positioned within them. Uh, Gonzalo is senior economist at the MPI uh, Global Practice of the World Bank. Uh, he leads the World Bank's trade engagements uh, with the governments of Pakistan and Nepal his work focuses on issues of uh, trade policy and trade competitiveness, uh, specifically on links between policy decisions and form performance dynamics. He draws on more than 15 years of experience with the public and private sector in Latin America and the Caribbean, North Africa, South and East Asia. Uh, prior to joining the World Bank Group, Gonzalo Tak at the University of Sussex, uh, the University of Pisa and School of Santana, uh, and also he worked for the um, uh, Ministry of Industry in Uruguay. He holds a PhD in economics and a master in international economics from the University of Sussex. So I uh, am inviting uh, both of the speakers on the uh, stage to uh, help. So the first session is on global value chains in economic and uh, the uh, on intellectual property rights and global value chains, which would be uh, uh, conducted by Dr. Gulam Sawad. Yes. Thank you, Karim. Uh, <coughs> let me explain the purpose of today's session. Uh, when Gonzalo last time visited us, that he was interested to discuss especially with the Khan student about the global value change. So the purpose was to educate the student and then if some of you guys can pick up the ideas on the global value change and work uh, with us uh, on a global value change. So uh, my uh, uh, purpose for today's discussion is again, I've been developing this idea of the intellectual property rights in the global value change. Uh, recently, I presented this idea in one of the Jakarta uh, conferences uh, organized by the ADB. And this is again in economics a very niche thing that you know very specifically uh, I'm looking to the intellectual property right enforcement in a specific country in how the global value chain basically will 
are kind of encouraged by the enforcement of the IPs laws in a specific countries. So again, my purpose again for you guys, if you can pick uh, this idea and work uh, with me, uh, you know, on this specific niche thing, uh, and then that would be uh, that would be great. So let me uh, start off with the sequence of my presentation. Uh, and again, I, I'm not going. To, I don't have any analysis for the IP and the global value change. But I will try to walk you guys through the, you know, what are their kind of issues and how we can, you know, tackle this issue. And then if you can come up, you know, at the end with some possible solution, then, then you know, that is the basic purpose for today's presentation. So, uh, the very specific literature review, uh, followed by the research question that I'm looking forward for, followed by, we do have a measurement issue while, you know, as a con student, uh, you guys must be aware of the global chain measurement issues and then the IP measurement issues. And then specific situation analysis where Pakistan is basically standing in terms of the IP enforcement. And then Gonzalo will talk about the uh, where Pakistan is basically positioned in terms of the global value change. And then I will end up with the uh, conclusion. So uh, uh, again, you guys are aware of the global uh, value change played a very significant significant role uh, in the world trade and investment. And if you can look at the recent UNCTAD data, you know, almost 85% of the trade, the global trade, <coughs> is in the uh, global value change. So again, the, uh, when there's a global value change, it's bringing in the efficiency and reduce the cost of production. Instead of, you know, uh, grounding all of your production in one specific country, you can, you can sparse it out to the rest of the countries. So it's a basically bringing in the efficiencies and reduce the uh, cost. Uh, production but one what important thing the last uh, point is here that how we can link this enforcement of IP with the national innovation system so we do have a national innovation system and then we do have a global value change so the question that I'm looking forward is whether the global value chain is attracted by the enforcement of the uh, national innovation system or not so I don't want to go to the details but these two guys had an empirical uh, study uh, for three countries, uh, for three years for uh, 75 uh, developing countries, and again you can uh, see when there's an enforcement in a specific country, how complex product can be exported. Uh, secondly, if, if you uh, look into the Chen study, uh, this was again, uh, you know, basically the IPR provisions in the international treaties. And when there is a provision in the international studies, how much it contributes to the deepening of the global value change. And again, one thing that is really important, uh, and then we, we, we will later on spot it out, the strength and then the time of the global value chain. There are two countries, but they are there in a global value chain for a very limited time. So whether they, they, the time span does matter for us uh, in terms of the national innovation system or not. And the third study is again, uh, look into the enforcement of the IP in a specific uh, country, but whether that specific enforcement in the IP's laws attract the complexity uh, in, in terms of the uh, imp import technologies or not. So these are my two research questions. Uh, the first one is the whether the IP protection, they secure the global value chain or not. And the second question uh, is, is, what are the other factors that can attract the global value change? So, to educate the students on the literature, recently Johnson had a published a paper in the NBER in, in he categorically uh, discussed two approaches how to measure the global value change. The first one is the macro approach and the second one is the micro approach. In a micro, macro approach, uh, he go with the national input output tables or the word input output tables. And, 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 and I, I believe some of you guys will be aware of the input output table, how we can basically measure the value inside the input output tables. But we do have a limitation while you are working on the global value uh, change uh, using the word input output tables. The first one is the data coverage. It's again for the least developing countries and for many developing countries. Unfortunately for Pakistan, our input output table is way old. Uh, we do have an upgraded one, but still uh, it's, it's, it's very old. The ADB is helping us, in, and recently the one published in 2017, but their sectoral, they, they only covered 40 by 40 sectors, instead of ours, ours was uh, almost 100, 100 sectors that was developed in Pi in 1990. 
the second issue is the data aggregation. And again, this concordance across the country, across the region, is again one of the biggest issues once, once you go with the uh, macro approaches. The micro approach, when you go with the farm level data, again mentioned by this uh, Johnson in, in, in their paper, we got these three issues. Offshoring is one of the biggest issues. How you can replace your domestic inputs with your foreign inputs. Uh, secondly, how you can link with the, the, the imports with the export uh, participation. Uh, when you are doing with the farm to farm transaction. And thirdly, how these MNCs are organizing uh, their networks. So these are the three issues while you are working with the farm level data. I don't want to go to the benefit of these macro and micro approaches. We do have our benefits, but just want to quickly wrap up and give you guys an idea. And then we are looking forward to listen to uh, Gonzalo. Uh, the second uh, important uh, stuff while we are working in this area is the uh, intellectual property measurement issues. In literature, these three indices have been used, but the one uh, by Ginati and Park is the recent one. It does have a limitation, but we can uh, use in the literature while we are working on the uh, specific relationship between the uh, IPs and then the global value change. Uh, the situation analysis in terms of the national innovation system, we are basically currently, we are standing in how this IPO Pakistan was when established in 2005, has been helping us in terms of granting patent to different multinational corporations. So uh, before uh, IPO 2005, most of our components, copyrights, trademark, patent, designs, they were they desegregated and that was placed in different ministries. But now after this IPO Pakistan, we got kind of, you know, all these different operation inside the one window. This is a trend uh, where you can see the uh, enforcement of IPR slowly and gradually in Pakistan uh, with, the, with the passage of time, especially after 2005. Uh, uh, here the uh, patent protection index developed by Ginati and Park. And clearly you can see 1995 when we got the uh, GATE agreement, the general agreement on trade and tariff. And after the uh, uh, GATE agreement, when we are signatory to WTO, our patent uh, protection been increasing. Although the total range, rest of this, uh, the, the other country is, you know, uh, the, the range is from 0 to 5, we are somewhere close to 3. But clearly you can see uh, where we are standing in terms of the national innovation system uh, um, measured by the IP protection index. Here, uh, to figure out like how much multinational, how much countries basically consider the national innovation system when they are trying to ground in, in your domestic economies or they are trying to pass it out their production processes. So I tried to get the data from the uh, IPO Pakistan and here clearly you guys can see the, the, the USA is on the top who have granted maximum of patents uh, by, by the government of Pakistan. In, and by the European Union, we got the Germany and the rest of the countries are, are obvious here. But this was one of my hypotheses, you know, if there is an innovation, if there is a national innovation system, whether the, uh, the, the, the countries are, 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 are coming into Pakistan or not in terms of the, uh, the patent registration. But to figure it out further, I tease it out further to the multinational level. In here again, I got this data from the IPO Pakistan and unfortunately, th these names are not obvious here, but these are the multinational who got the maximum patents in Pakistan uh, uh, since 2005. So again, uh, you know, these are the, uh, especially uh, the companies who are on the medicine, but we got also the Honda and rest of the companies are here. The purpose of this desegregation again is how we can link this global value chain with the uh, IP uh, protection in the specific countries. In here, again, uh, the uh, oh, not only the IP, but other uh, 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 factors or variables do matter when global values change, uh, you know, come into your country. And one of the factors that right now I'm considering is the market size. In here you can see the relationship between the market size and the granted of patents uh, 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 in, in, in Pakistan. So my preliminary conclusion here is, I believe the IP protection play a significant role in, in, in attracting the multinational corporations, which will eventually help in the global value change. And second uh, preliminary conclusion is the market size play a dominant role in bringing the multinationals. So I will end uh, here 
And then uh, I will request uh, Gonzalo to discuss, you know, on the global value chain where Pakistan is positioned. And then later on, uh, I will, we will take a question. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the, for the invitation. Uh, hi. Um, I, I wanted to mention that uh, at the beginning, Ulam said uh, that we, we wanted to educate uh, the audience. In my case, I want also to be educated. I just arrived in Pakistan. Uh, two and a half months ago, I was going to be here for three years, I went to the World Bank, uh, I did the train program. Uh, but uh, as I said, you know, I have a lot to learn from, from all of you on Pakistan. So we discussed some insights on what role global value chains are playing in global trade and what Pakistan is inserted, but I look forward to a, to a conversation uh, in this area. My presentation will be uh, perhaps less sophisticated than, than Gulam's. If he was talking about you know, intellectual property rights of thinking already on a grain in the value chains, uh, I, I, I just want to give a, a primer into what global value chains are. So perhaps to start with uh, an outline, four main pillars uh, that I will discuss. First of all, what is it? What, what are global value chains? So everybody talks about global value chains. What are global value chains? Why is it that they became prominent features of all trades? So he was just saying about 85% of trade happens through global value chains. Why? What happened? Uh, and then third, how do we measure integration into global value chains? And then how integrated is Pakistan? And then the final point that I think perhaps is the most interesting is what are the public policy implications of a world in which trade takes place through uh, international production networks or global value checks, CMs, right? So to start with, I think the most prominent example of what a value chain a global is, is, is this, right? Is the iPhone. Uh, the iPhone has parts produced in so many different countries, right? The processor is produced in Taiwan. The, the touch screen is produced in Korea. Uh, there it is assembled in, in Foxconn in China but they need companies Apple that is in California, right? So you have, uh, you have, you can break down the different parts of this and each little part will be produced somewhere else, right? In a different place in the world. So if you look at the number of firms that are contributing to the production of this little device, right? You have 349 companies in China that are working for producing an iPhone. You have about 60 companies in the United States. You have companies in Brazil, in Mexico, in Japan, in Taiwan, in Singapore, in Germany, etc., etc., etc. All of these companies are working to produce one single item that is assembled in China and marketed by an American company. Right? That is an example, perhaps the most prominent example of a global value chain. However, it doesn't need to be so sophisticated. So. Here you have something that I came across not long ago. That is a package of salt. I was barbecuing and I was putting some salt in my meat and I realized that this Himalayan salt was an example of a global value chain. So I looked at the package and it says that it's a product of Pakistan that is packed in South Africa and that is actually marketed by a UK company with residence in Manchester, right? So there you have three countries involved in the production of marketing, market of salt, yeah? So you don't need so much sophistication. Global value chains can happen in hyper-sophisticated product like an iPhone, it can happen in simple food product like salt. So what are the key characteristics? Well, a value chain is a full range of value-adding activities in the supply chain that go from research and development at the very beginning when you're devising, you're designing a, a product, right? and they go all the way to customer support when you're distributing and doing after sales uh, services. Value added, what is value added? We all know, I think, what value added is, the amount by which the value of a good or service is increased at each stage of production, right? And the crucial element of a global value chain is that this value is created in different countries, right? So that there is international fragmentation of production. So value addition happens across different geographical locations. In general, there's a governance to this that is quite important. There's a lead firm that typically is the final producer, but doesn't need to be. Uh, that also, in this case, for example, piece of salt, it was the Manchester firm. 
uh, who include other, <coughs> other firms at the first tier. Uh, and these lead firms, in general, the ones that accrue or obtain or end up receiving most of the value that is created. So the, the funny thing about global value chains is that they are not really global, right? They are more regional. And this is crucial for Pakistan. If you look at how these global value chains are structured, you're going to see that you have factory Asia around China and Japan, and you have a lot of suppliers supply to Chinese or Japanese companies. You have factory Europe, you know, a lot of firms supply to companies in France and Germany, and in fact, fact you have factory America, you have Canadians and Mexican companies supplying to American uh, lead value chains. So while we call them global, mostly they take the form of regional value chains, and this is why in, in this world of global value chains, what your neighbor does matters for you, right? And how competitive your neighbor is, and how friendly you are with your neighbor <laughs> matters, because the first step to integrate is with your neighbor. So that is one element to keep in mind. Uh, it's more about production than our value, and it's more of a complex network than a chain, but we kept the global value chain name because it's quite like a, you know, a flashy, title and that's what we call them, but they are not global, they are not about value, they are about production, they are not really chains, they are complex networks. We have different stages of production and these different stages of production are create different values. We were talking before coming here that you know there are you, if you get stuck in in the in this fragmentation of production in, in producing simple things, you're going to accrue little value. And what this the smiley curve is showing is along the different stages of production how much value accrues to each stage. And you see that at the very beginning of the production process, when you do basic and applied design, when you do research and development, you accrue a lot of value. Those activities have a lot of value that you can obtain from it. Then when you get into the manufacturing, the parts and the components that are standardized, then you accrue less value, right? Anyone can do that. Right? But not everyone can do the research and develop because that takes knowledge. And then there's closer to final demand, the marketing, advertising, brand management, all of that also accrues value. If you see the beginning at the end of the chain that accrue a lot of value, typically are sophisticated services. And what you have in the middle that accrues less value are more standardized manufacturing processes that anyone can do. They, they can be outsourced anywhere in the world and so it's cheaper to do that, and therefore those that produce in those segments accrue less value. Now, how is it that all of this happens? So why is it that trade moved into a, a, a frame of global value chains? Uh, and here I will borrow from uh, an international economist called Richard Baldwin, I don't know if you've heard of him. He wrote a very nice book about global value chains called The Great Convergence. If you are interested in the topic, I, I highly recommend you have a look at it. And basically what he argues is, in international trade, there are three important costs. The first one is the cost of moving goods across borders, right? The, what we typically know as trade costs. Then there are also communication costs. There are the cost of moving ideas across borders. And then there are the cost of moving people, right? The face-to-face -face costs. Well, what he argues is that what global value chains are, they are basically two unbundlings happen. The first unbundling happened after the, the first industrial revolution in the 1800s, where the costs of moving goods fell. And they fell because they had the steamboat, and so it was cheaper to move uh, goods across oceans, and uh, you have railways, and you could move goods across space, right? And so. That reduction in trade costs meant, and, and stiff communication costs being high, meant that you separated consumption and production. And the separation of consumption and production implied that now you have countries that were stuck with high know-how, right? <coughs> now they were producing sophisticated products, and therefore were paying high wages to the workers. And countries that were stuck with low know-how they were producing less sophisticated products, and then they were stuck with lower wages, right? And so, in a way, there was sort of a monopoly 
power that the that the workers in high know-how countries had so that they could get high wages. So in Europe and in the United States, in Australia, they have high know-how and the workers there get higher salaries because they operate in an environment in which there's high know-how and so they get high wages. People in poorer countries, in Latin America, and South Asia, East Asia, Africa, lower know-how and so they, they get necessarily low wages, right? Now, what happened next? What happened is that with the ICT revolution in the 1990s, the communication cost fell. And with the communication cost fell falling, then what happened is that multinational companies, or big companies, realized they could fragment their process of production and they didn't need to produce from beginning to end something, say, in Germany, if it was cheaper to produce some parts somewhere else. Right? So Adidas realized he didn't need to produce everything in Germany. He could actually outsource part of the production to uh, labor-intensive countries because he could easily communicate with the branch he had, say, in Pakistan or with the branch he had, say, in Bangladesh. Right? The communication cost failed and therefore you could not only separate consumption and production, you could separate production itself, the different phases, and outsource the things that require labor uh, and skill from the things that require skill labor. Now, what that separation meant is that now, what, what this technology made possible is that now you're co you combining the high know-how that headquarters will have, say, in Germany, with the low wages of the workers that are in factories, say in Bangladesh or in Pakistan or in India or in Honduras um, or Mexico, right? And that is a combination that is quite powerful <coughs> because basically technology made it possible, this combination, but economics or competition made it necessary. So you can't compete now if you don't combine high know-how with low wages, right? And the implications of this were quite tremendous. If you look at the manufacturing shares, right, the world manufacturing shares over time, you see that the G7, right, the group of the seven largest, most developed countries in the world, the manufacturing share went from 65% in the 70s to 47% in, uh, in 2010. That de decline is explained ma mainly by an increase in the share of manufacturing in the hands of China from 3 to 19 percent, and in the hands of the six prices, Thailand, Indonesia, India, Poland, and Korea, uh, that went from 5 to 9 percent. The rest of the world remained relatively stable, right? But the share of world GDP explained by the G7 countries also fell dramatically between 1983 to 2014. So this was sort of a game changer, but not for everyone. So not everyone took advantage of this game changer. Some did, some did not. Okay. Now, why do we care about this? We care because they are a dominant feature of world trade, and we care because it allows global value chains allow countries to specialize in specific products or tasks without needing to have the capabilities to produce something from beginning to end, right? So there is more scope for learning to trade, there is more scope for productivity growth, and therefore there is also more scope for increasing in incomes, wages, and GDP uh, growth. And there are implications of how we think about it. So let's get into some of these implications. I'm going to show you now what you have there in the screen is what happened to electrical equipment production in Vietnam between 1985 and 2011. So in 1985, of all the electrical equipment exports in Vietnam, 45% of them were domestic value added, and 55% were of import content, right? So in, in intermediate inputs that were imported and embedded into the exports of electrical equipment in Vietnam. And then in 2011, what happened? In 2011, the domestic share went to 31%, and the imported share increased to 61%. Is that good news or bad news for Vietnam? How many say it's bad news? Can you raise your hands, the ones that think that's bad news? 
How will you say it's good news? Well, we don't know from that chart, right? So, but now I will show you this chart here that tells you that actually Vietnam was exporting one fifth of a billion dollars of electrical equipment in 1985, and in 2011 it was exporting almost four billion, right? So, yes, you have a smaller pack, a smaller share of the pie that is domestic value added, but the pie is much larger. So actually that 31% of the $3.8 billion is much higher than the 45% of the $0.2 billion in terms of value, right? And this is often what happens when you integrate in global value chains. You use a lot of what the rest of the world produces, right? So you, add, you use a lot of imported inputs, but you produce more because you're integrated, you get a market access through this integration to global value chains. So one implication is that you need to be more welcoming to importing, because the only way you're going to be able to export if you're part of a global value chain is by also importing parts and components. It also has implications about what we think about bilateral trade imbalances. And this, uh, you know, I, I come from, a, I, I'm Uruguayan, but I, I live in the United States. In the United States now, we talk a lot about bilateral trade. So the, the current president focuses a lot about bilateral trade. And this is something many people focus. And what you have there in that chart is the bilateral trade with China, Pakistan China. So what you see there from 2003 to 2018, exports of Pakistan to China increased but exports of China to Pakistan increased by much more, right? People worry about that. People say that uh, the China-Pakistan free trade agreement is not benefiting Pakistan, right? Now, the problem, what is the problem of looking at bilateral trade deficit? Should we evaluate the, the Pakistan-China free trade agreement by the bilateral trade deficit? Probably not. Why? I'm going to tell you why, or I'm going to give you two examples of why. So one thing that happened with this China-Pakistan free trade agreement is that Pakistani producers of batteries started importing evaporators from China. So these evaporators were key to produce the batteries, and then these batteries were exported to Afghanistan. Also, Pakistani producers of refrigerators started importing cheaper compressors from China, and therefore were able to export the refrigerators to Afghanistan. Now, you see this in the imports of Pakistan from China, but you don't see these refrigerators or batteries in the exports of Pakistan to China, because they were exported somewhere else. So there you have a regional or global, as you like to call it, value chain, right? So these are benefits <coughs> of being integrated with China. You get cheaper import inputs that allow you to export somewhere else, yeah? Uh, but you forget about that if you just focus on that bilateral trading balance, right? So think about value added rather than thinking about gross, uh, gross terms. The other element is that your competitiveness in a global value chain will depend on what your investment and trade partners do. So if, you're, if your partner is Adidas, sophisticated company, that is with which you work together to produce the 10 stars, that's what what Pakistan uh, exports, right, is this uh, footballs. Then the ability, the, the competitiveness of the producers of Telstar here in Pakistan will depend on the competitiveness of Adidas. And Adidas embeds a lot of knowledge into the Telstar. For example, there was a chip that was embedded so that, you know, the, the fan, football fans could follow the speed of the ball, et cetera, et cetera, in, in their mobile phones. Well, that is knowledge that is incorporated, that is knowledge that needs to be handled by producers of footballs here in Pakistan, right? So your competitiveness will depend on, on the competitiveness of your partner. So you're interested in your partner doing better because if your partner does better, you'll do better. Okay, so that's, that's uh, as much as I can say about generalities. Now let's talk a little bit about Pakistan. So how Pakistan has been doing in global markets first and then in global value chains. So, first of all, let's say that over the last 13 years, Pakistan hasn't been doing very well in terms of trade performance, particularly in terms of export performance. 
what you see there are three charts. The first one shows export growth, the second one shows FDI, and the third one shows global market shares of Pakistan. And you compare Pakistan with Bangladesh, Thailand, and Vietnam in terms of exports. Pakistan's exports over the last 13 years increased by about 50 percent. Pakistan, Vietnam's exports increased by about 650 percent. Right. So a little dynamism. Part of that is linked to the multinational company uh, inflow that has been weak in Pakistan, about one and, and a little bit of GDP on average per year of inflows of, of FDI. Compare that to Vietnam, about 6% uh, of GDP per year. So that is already giving you a hint that Pakistan hasn't been able to integrate into global value chains as much as one would have expected. And the, the, the uh, consequence of this is declining, uh, declining global market shares in, in world exports from about 0.14% to about 0.12% in safety, right? Uh, this shows into in, in, in sectoral performance. You can see, I, I, I'm not gonna dwell into this, but in most of the sectors, Pakistan has lost market share uh, over the period. And it also shows in the uh, sustainability of export flows, so the, the probability of export flows staying alive uh, for more than uh, one year. This is also, uh, Pakistan is overperformed by India and by uh, Vietnam in this respect. So let me uh, speed up, I, I think I'm a little bit I'm okay. okay. Yeah. So that is performance of a trade, but let's, let's see how is how can we measure integration of Pakistan into global value chain? So the typical, there are two typical indicators. One is to say, what is the foreign value added that is embedded in Pakistan's exports? The other indicator is how much of Pakistan's value added is embedded into third country exports, right? So the first one tells you how integrated you are in global value chains as a buyer. The second one tells you how integrated you are as a set. Right? So what, what we see here is the comparison of Pakistan and some other countries, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, India, Nepal, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, and Vietnam. And as Gulam was saying before, this is built on the basis of world uh, input output tables uh, and data is sporadic because not all countries uh, update their data. So for Foreign value added in gross exports, we have an update for 2018. This is an UNCTAD uh, world input output table that we're using here. Uh, and what you can see is that among all those comparators, Pakistan is the one that has the lowest share of foreign value in gross exports. And this is, so this means that it's not so integrated as a value, right? And it means also that all this discussion that is out there about the high imports in Pakistan, right? These high imports in Pakistan are being used for industrial purposes, yes, but not for ex not by exporters. So exporters struggle using intermediate imports from abroad, and part of the struggle is that they have to pay high import duties. Even if in principle they are exempted, it's very difficult to get exemption. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but but that is that shows in the low import content of exports when you compare that with, uh, with others. Where you have more is you have more domestic value added in country exports, and part of that is the fact that A, Pakistan exports a lot of textiles, yarn, and synthetic fibers, and also uh, some agricultural products that get embedded into other countries' exports. It shows also in the composition of imports and exports, right? So as I was mentioning before, most of the imports are industrial supplies, fuels, and capital goods. Most of the exports are consumer goods or uh, industrial supplies. And if you look at what specific value chains Pakistan is inserted into, you're gonna see, you know, one can think about six uh, global value chains that are quite uh, well established. One is vehicles, another one is electronics, another is apparel and footwear, another is uh, intermediate apparel and footwear. Pakistan is basically integrated in final apparel and footwear, final textiles, and intermediate apparel and footwear, uh, with some 
declines or some decay in the participation into intermediate apparel and, uh, and food. So if we go into the firm level and if we look at the performance of firms of specific exporters and how are these uh, exporters performing uh, over, over time in Pakistan, how do they compare with, uh, with the world? What we see is that in Pakistan we see small exporters, right? Many, and uh, that they don't make it to the, the status of superstar. So the first chart there uh, on the left is showing you the number of exporters by country compared to the level of development of the country. And what you see there is Pakistan is about the line. So for the level of development of the country, Pakistan has more exporters than what one would expect. It's a large country, so it has many exporters. So that's a good thing. Then this, this slide in the middle shows this average size of these exporters across countries, again, benchmarking against level of income per capita. And what you see there is Pakistan is below the line, meaning <laughs> given the level of development, exporters are typically smaller than one would expect. So many small exporters. And then there is less concentration of exports in the top 5% of firms, meaning that there are no super large firms that manages to uh, add to the dynamism of the export sector. And at the same time, what you have is low entry rates, you have low exit rates, and you have higher survival rates of entry. So you don't have a lot of movement so you have a lot of incumbents that stay there for a long time. So there is something with entrepreneurship ecosystem that is preventing more firms entering uh, into export markets. And there is also something that is preventing the ones that are not productive enough to exit uh, that export market. So you have the, the good old ones that stay, stick to, uh, to that export market. Okay. So, now, let's, let's get into the, the, the so what, right? So what is it that in a world of GVCs, how is it that trade policy should look like? And perhaps before I, I talk about this, what do you think should policy look like in a world of global value chains in terms of trade policy? Do you have any insights? But in terms of policies, right? So in terms of things that the government can actually use as a policy level. So in terms of, for example, tariffs, or in terms of uh, investment policies, or in terms of uh, restrictions to foreign service providers, or this type of things. It should be more open. It should be more open. It should be more receptive to new technology that can enter the country. Uh -huh. So here I have a, a few thoughts about this, right? So first of all, if you want to support integration to global value chains, the first thing you need to understand is what is the structure of the value chain you want to support, right? And what the value constraints are. So one thing that we know from the literature is that most distortions happen upstream. So you need to understand if what you want to support is the value chain of a pattern, you want to understand what are the main inputs into a pattern and where are the, the restrictions, where are the distortions happening. Typically, they have an upstream. And if you don't understand the structure of the value chain, you're not going to understand what that upstream is about. So that's one thing. The second is that there are interactions between merchandise service and investment that matter, right? Um, and so, one element that is crucial is that you need the FDI. So if you want to integrate in global value chains, there's no other way but attracting multinationals. It's going to be very difficult for you to do it if you don't attract multinational companies to come and participate in your markets. And participate not as market seekers, but participate <laughs> as efficiency seekers. It's coming to build an export platform in your country, right? And so that is crucial. So one of the key elements there is fix your investment policy laws so that they are welcoming 
to sectors that are you, you're interested in them. The second thing is a, a, something that sometimes is forgotten, that is services account for a big share of value added in the rules. And so if you want to develop a value chain, you probably need to think about competition in services. And competition in services is something that oftentimes lacks in many countries. Services is a sector that is plagued with, uh, with inefficiencies and with lack of competition. And here, this is for Pakistan. This is the share of services that are embedded in exported value added, right, for different sectors. And you see that in primary agriculture, is the first bar there, 20% of value added in exports of primary agriculture actually come from services. That means that if you want to support primary agriculture, one of the things that you need to do is you need to incorporate more competition in transport, for example, because that's a key element in the value added that is embedded in the exports of primary agriculture. If you go to clothing, textiles, it's much, even much higher, right? About 40% services. Uh, as I was mentioned before, transport, distribution, and business services at ICT are key uh, players there. I'm losing my audience, so I, I, I'll be quick. Uh, now, the, the, the other element in global value chains is that trade costs are going to be exacerbated. Why? Because in a world of global value chains, goods cross borders many times. That's the essence of the global value chain, right? That production is fragmented internationally. So if production is fragmented internationally, you have, you have imported inputs that are moving the borders several times. And so if you put barriers to move these goods across borders, being those tariffs, or non-tariff measures of customs, inefficiencies, etc., you're accumulating this cost of moving, moving goods across borders uh, over time, right? So information costs, trade facilitation related costs, trade policy related costs are going to be exacerbated. Let's talk about trade policy and let's talk about upstream tariffs, right? So in Pakistan, this is in Pakistan with the latest data uh, from the tariff policy, what we see is that the tariff schedule is not making it any easy for Pakistan exporters to compete globally, right? Why? Because they charge high tariffs on the inputs on the raw materials that they are uh, using. Give you an example. For leather products, leather product producers pay on their inputs 26% of input tariffs on average, right? Uh, I think uh, you have their uh, wedding apparel that is about 6 to 7%. And that, that is, a, that is a, a high cost for firms. And the largest firms can claim import uh, duty rebates. The smaller firms will struggle to get those import duty rebates and will struggle with the financial costs of those import duty rebates. So to, to finish, basically in a world of global value chains, goods cross borders several times. What we need is trade costs that are low so that they don't accumulate quickly. We need less restrictions to trading services because services trade is a key element in uh, the, the value addition process. We need investment policies that are open and investment promotion efforts that are targeted to those sectors that you want to boost. <coughs> yeah. And if you do want to provide protection, this protection needs to be clear uh, in writing. It needs to be transparent to everyone and it needs to have sunset clauses so everybody knows when this is going to finish and when you're going to be open to competition. So with this, I will uh, stop. And Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo. And uh, somewhat for informing us on intellectual property rights and global data change. Actually, the four or five points uh, which I got from the presentations. First is efficient IPR laws are encouraging integration to global data change. Second, global value chains are increasingly becoming regional uh, as compared to global. The third is uh, be more welcoming to imports and focus on domestic value added to imports. Uh, and fourth, through global value chains, uh, you get cheaper imports for your uh, export oriented industries. Uh, fifth, uh, inflow of MNCs are lower in Pakistan and therefore it should be encouraged because they uh, bring new technology in, uh, combined with FDI. And uh, uh, last, uh, Pakistan should have uh, a predictable 
uh, an efficient trade policy, uh, as is uh, said by the Gonzalo in the last slide. So actually, now the time is for questions. We will take two to three questions, and then uh, the speakers uh, will respond accordingly. So now let's start with the questions. Yes, my mood. I'm Khalid from Bait. I work in microeconomics. And coincidentally, I'm the first questioner in the last seminar on the tariff policy as well. So I'll try to be very brief. Just two questions, one from Mam Samas. My understanding with the BICO was that once you get your patent or any intellectual property, the district gets Globally, it doesn't need to be like uh, rectified again by the uh, respective country in which you're going to do business. But the graph which you're uh, showing requires that the MNCs have to get the patents uh, again registered to pass. And so that was a question of confusion. Second, from uh, the presentation by Gonzalo, um, can you comment about that uh, in terms of countries having more uh, JCBs? are the ones which earlier were basically major traders as well. Because my context in this is that if you look at the tendency position, that remains the same. So the <coughs> ultimate beneficiary of all this trading system goes to certain particular countries. So it would really depend that what type of tax policies and other policies, macroeconomic policies each country is adopting. Because now the exchange rate pass through monetary policy effects and the tax competition would really matter. Thank you. More for Sadia. Uh, I'm Sadia Shabazz, I'm a PhD student in Paris. Uh, so my uh, question is from Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, <coughs> Pakistan, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I might be, uh, uh, my information obviously is more limited than yours right now in Pakistan's trade context. But Pakistan seems to be stuck in the lower end of the U diagram that you made in terms of policy. We are not generating ideas and we are not a big enough market to be attracted. Well, I'm, when I'm, not, I'm not considering the population size. I'm talking about as compared to other regional competitors like India or China. We don't seem to be uh, either uh, on either of the higher ends of the value chain you shape uh, that you make. Uh, so what would be your opinion and your intake on this? Uh, what, uh, the, what can be Pakistan's prospects and then in terms of global value Secondly, my question is uh, that what if, uh, if you look at uh, Pakistan's political situation, it is very much linked to your economic, uh, in our, our economic situation. Out of many regional partners, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, we do not have a very good relationship, politically speaking. And it is causing a lot of impediment in terms of trade and investment for the country. How are we, uh, how can we kind of solve for that without considering a more uh, harmonious political scenario, uh, scenario in the region. Because like you said, global value chains are actually regional value chains and if you are not working as a region productively, then how is it going to work for a country like ours? Thank you. Yes. yes. My name is Nadia Sen and uh, I am from uh, International Summit University doing PhD in Economics. And uh, my question is related to the uh, problem you have highlighted that we have small exporters and uh, uh, there is lack of superstars. So uh, there is the uh, 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 issue you have discussed about the new entrants. And uh, as uh, the given situation of Pakistan, there are uh, there is uh, more than half of the uh, industrial sector that is in, in the informal economy. So, uh, what can be policy perspectives for the SMEs <coughs> to uh, get integrated into this uh, uh, system and uh, become a superstar, or uh, we can integrate them in the export system? Okay, so let's uh, speak around answers, then we can have a second round of questions. Uh, uh, Khalid, uh, we do have international protocol basically, and then you can file your uh, invention or patent individually as well as collectively. So for example, if you want to file your invention in the EU, you can simultaneously file your innovation in a Germany country as well. So we, we do have a regional international protocol as well. 
I'll, I'll, um, I'll start from the end. Uh, so I'll start with Nadia's Nadia, right? Nadia's uh, question first. Uh, so the the role of SMEs in, in global value chains is quite quite relevant, right? So the way the what one of the things that global value chains facilitate is internationalization of firms at lower uh, capability and le levels of capability. So. so before you have to become an exporter, you need to be a sophisticated firm because you need to be with very complicated stuff. There's finding clients abroad, knowing what they want, how to price products, how to market and package, etc. If, if instead you manage to connect to a multinational, you get the spillovers of connecting with a technologically more sophisticated firms. You learn from that and you can be a supplier, right? Become internationalized as a supplier. Um, for that, from a policy perspective, what many countries have done successfully is uh, suppliers development <coughs> programs. So programs of support to small and medium enterprises so that they can become accredited suppliers to larger companies. Now, for those programs to be uh, to have any, any benefit, you need a, a, a solid base of multinational companies in the country, right? So this is something that's still lacking perhaps in Pakistan to a certain extent. To have a solid basis of multinational companies with which these small and medium enterprises can collect. But once you have that, the, the issue of informality that you were mentioning, uh, you know, informality is endogenous. So firms don't become formal because they have no incentives to become formal. So it's the, the benefits of it remaining informal are greater than, than, than the cost of being formal, right? The moment you start having opportunities that only accrue to you because you're formal, say because you get credit or because you are a, a supplier to a multinational and you gain from that, then these, these incentives uh, become uh, binding and you start uh, changing that sort of equation. So that, that's on, on that side. Then on the other two questions, they were somehow related in terms of, if I got the, the questions right, is what is there, so how can Pakistan attract? So what, what are the policies that are needed? How, how do you attract uh, multinationals when you have a region that is uh, perhaps not conducive to setting up this at the regional level? and when you, your market size is not that attractive either. So one thing that I would mention there is that the opportunity for Pakistan is in sophisticated services. I, 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 I encourage, I would encourage also the government to think about uh, integration in global energy chains in offshore services. Um, offshore services don't require a region. You can trade them globally much easier than you can trade goods globally. Uh, so that the, the region is not a binding constraint for, for services. Um, the talent seems to be there. So Pakistan exports a lot of uh, software development services, for example. So you know a, a lot of integration can happen there. And that can help you move away from the center of that uh, smiley curve and accrue more value. Uh, but yes, you need macro stability to attract those type of investments. Uh, you need investment uh, policies that are uh, at least harmonious. We currently have some some uh, contradictions between investment law in 1976 and investment policy in 2013 that need to be uh, you know harmonized. I mean, trade policies that are conducive to, to integration in GDC, so those things I think need to be to be tackled. Okay. Okay. So you. Board of Investment in Tech. Uh, my question is that uh, trade policy is very important for uh, uh, economic development. Um, well, what you would suggest that what type of uh, specific policies uh, uh, we can uh, offer to uh, multinational companies or uh, uh, international companies to come to Pakistan and invest and uh, or become a trading partners with our local uh, local companies? Uh, what type of specific policies we offer? And another question is that um, the CPEC, uh, which is regarded as the uh, main game um, uh, changing uh, in the trading world, um, how Pakistan can uh, get benefit uh, in terms of trade from uh, this question? Uh, my question is from this. Uh, and go. Oh, smart. Uh, I was basically wondering about the new direct policy that the government has Well, 
this one. Okay. So, I just, I just would like to ask about this, uh, you know, difference between China and Pakistan. You know, important difference. So, uh, do you think that it's, it's because of you know China has an upper hand, always you know a lot of uh, debts and other things are involved? Another thing I would like to ask: um, how it can reverse in a way? Okay, that's it. That's good. Yeah. Just a question that when we are looking for <coughs> our neighboring country and they are doing well in terms of their industrialization and also some other things. And when we talk about the regionalization, we have so many bilateral as well as multilateral agreements. Where Pakistan lies behind in all this stuff, whether in, in terms of bilateral trade, we have number of bilateral trade, we are part of so many regional agreements like Dr. and but other countries are doing well and we are suffering behind this. Why? So I will start with the national tariff policy because that's my, my favorite. Uh, the, the national tariff policy is a, is a step in the right direction. I, I personally believe it's a step in the right direction because it makes uh, tariff setting uh, an instrument for the reduction of trade costs rather than <laughs> an instrument for revenue collection. I think that is a, that is a, a positive step. It is also a positive step because it creates institutionality around the uh, setting, of, setting of tariffs and it increases interagency coordination, right? So there will be a national tariff board that in which finance, commerce, and PR will be seen. I think that is a positive development. Uh, and it's a positive development, the announcements that the tariffs will start falling gradually. Uh, I think uh, you know, the, without compromising the, the fiscal position of the government, I think this is something that is necessary and will be uh, a condition of success for integration in, in the world economy in general and mainly from that. I think on the question of incentives, that's a, it's a tough question. Uh, there's you know, there are, there's a lot of, of, of literature on that. There are a lot of experiences on that. Uh, my, my first reaction to this would be, the first thing to sort out is to level the playing field before you start thinking about specific uh, incentives, right? Uh, having wide access to intermediate in inputs from abroad, to machinery from abroad, so, can, so firms can choose. That is the first thing you need to attract any multinational to come, right? You need an investment policy that is harmonious, as I mentioned before, right? I think these are things that are going to level the playing field and are, are necessary conditions. Then you can consider experiences, you can consider global experiences, right? So for example, special economic zones have been used to uh, boost industrial development in many countries, in many places with a lot of success, in many places with a lot of failures. So it depends on how, what, you know, is, is there a problem around, uh, you know, availability of industrial land? Is there a problem around availability of basic supplies or utilities? Is it a problem about connectivity? So you need to identify what the problem is that firms are facing so that you can solve it. Uh, but granting incentives can be, uh, you know, come back fire in cases. So I think you need a, you need a very good analysis of what are the obstacles that multinationals are facing to come and invest in Pakistan and see how this can be solved. The first base, the first best is to solve them in a way that is uh, non-discriminatory, non right? In a, in a way that it benefits everyone. Uh, in some cases, this is uh, problematic and so it's very difficult and so you have special economic zones, so you have some sort of in-play type of but these systems need to be well justified. Uh, and, and I think a, a lot needs to be learned from your experience because uh, there are good and bad experiences around that. Um, there, was a, there was a question on China, Pakistan. Trade balance. balance or imbalance? So, so again, as I mentioned, I, 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 I don't like commenting on the bilateral uh, balance. I, I don't think that tells us anything. Uh, if anything we know from economics is that you benefit when you import, right? Uh, so reading a bilateral deficit as a negative thing, 
So perhaps we should be asking why is it Pakistan growing its exports? Uh, but the fact that Pakistan is importing from China, in the case they were importing compressors for generators for uh, for, for, for refrigerators that were exporting somewhere else. So the bilateral tends to play you. Uh, and in terms of agreements and the uh, I think Pakistan doesn't in fact is not signatory to many agreements. Uh, if you look in international comparison countries in general about they, they are signatories to 14 international trade agreements. Uh, Pakistan is signatory to four, probably. Uh, so it, Pakistan is not very well integrated uh, in, in the world economy. Uh, unilaterally, it has high tariffs, but also it, it, it's not part of the network of preferential trade agreements. It has TAFTA that is not fully implemented. Right? Uh, there are, there's the China-Pakistan free trade agreement, there is a negotiation with Turkey and Thailand, uh, but there's very little of that. In fact, uh, perhaps preferential trade agreements could be an avenue that if, if well <coughs> thought through, uh, can be a way in which Pakistan can get market access to, to its products in a more in a preferential way. Okay, thank you, Gonzalo, and let me add a bit on the incentives. In Pakistan, actually, the fiscal incentive didn't work as uh, is shown by our history. So what we need is actually uh, to just create a competitive private sector uh, by uh, facilitating the private sector, not uh, any fiscal incentives, so as is shown by our history. We have a failure in industrial states, and I hope that the special economic zones will not focus much on fiscal incentives rather than creating the competitive private sector. And let me thank uh, Gonzalo and Samad uh, for uh, having an interactive session with you guys and I hope you will learn a lot and uh, of course the people, uh, especially in particular the students who want to be in contact with Gonzalo and Summer, uh, they are very uh, welcome and actually yeah, I talk to them and they will be available to you uh, whenever you need uh, to do some work in this field. Thank you. Thank you.